Today's occurrence happens in Russia, but it started in space. One Friday morning in February, Yulia Karbysheva went to work as a school teacher. That day, she was substituting two classes, a total of 44 children. At around 9.30 a.m., there was a flash outside of the classroom window, and the kids rushed to see what the flash of light was. The second Yulia registered a bright flash of light, she ordered all of the students to take cover under their desks. She was running on pure instinct, and what she had them do was a duck and cover drill from the Cold War. While the children dove under their desks, she ran to open the interior doors of the classroom. The building they were in used to be a kindergarten, so the doors were glass. Less than three minutes after the flash, soon after Yulia opened the doors, a strong explosion followed. It moved quickly, shattering the glass in the room and hitting Yulia. If the children were panicking, Yulia wasn't. She calmly told the children to get dressed in what they needed to leave and had them evacuate outside. Luckily, none of the students received a single cut, but Yulia was injured to the point of needing hospitalization. Her left hand had cuts to the tendon and so did her left thigh. She would eventually be called a hero for thinking quickly and protecting the students, but what she didn't know at the time was that she was one of the thousands injured from a meteor that wasn't even the one predicted to come near Earth that day. I'm Tatiana Bunch, and this is the story of the Chelyabinsk meteor. On February 23rd, 2012, micro-asteroid 2012 DA-14 was discovered. It's 98 feet, or 30 meters, in diameter and was discovered by astronomers in Spain. The asteroid is significantly elongated and believed to be an uncommon reddish asteroid. Once its orbit was calculated, it was named Duende. Asteroids are given provisional names when they're discovered. After scientists map out its orbit, it's given a different name. It was named after goblin-like creatures from Filipino and Iberian mythology and folklore and you can fall down a rabbit hole learning about them. Once it was found, space agencies in countries around the world kept an eye on it to make sure it wouldn't cause any unexpected problems. Duende's approach was predicted well ahead of time, and it was fairly well publicized. So when scientists were expecting to see Duende on February 15th, approaching from about 17,000 miles or 28,000 kilometers away from Earth, it was an absolute shock to see something hit Russia 16 hours earlier than that. The meteor that struck Chelyabinsk came from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It wasn't an entire asteroid, but believed to be a fragment of one. One theory is that the Chelyabinsk meteor got caught in a tug of war, so to speak, with Jupiter's gravitational pull. It was pulled out of its usual path in the asteroid belt, which stretched its orbit around Jupiter and brought it closer to the sun. It eventually got close enough to cross Earth's path and enter its atmosphere. So right around sunrise, people in several federal republics of Russia and neighboring regions like Kazakhstan saw a bright burning object flying across the sky with a smoky streak trailing behind it. The glowing streak is called a meteor. It was a couple dozen miles south of Chelyabinsk and about 14 miles or 23 kilometers above ground when it exploded in a flash of light brighter than the sun. The shockwave from the explosion was so strong that it shattered windows and damaged buildings in Chelyabinsk and in nearby towns. No meteorite actually hit the ground in the city, but the airburst was more than enough to injure around 1,500 people and damage many buildings. When the meteor exploded, it fragmented into meteorites that fell to the ground outside of the city. The strength of the explosion was similar to releasing hundreds of thousands of tons of TNT. People reported bright flashes and feeling strong blast waves less than three minutes after seeing the meteor. The shockwave was strong enough to be registered as an earthquake too. Tatiana Vasilyeva was walking with her husband on the shore of the lake that Friday morning. She was an accountant but had retired so her morning was free. Something caught her eye, so she looked up and saw what appeared to be a star getting brighter and brighter, like the sun. She thought a fiery star was falling right on top of her, so she thought she should probably close her eyes now. 
She happily returned to the lake the next day without any major injuries and was actually kind of irritated because it was blocked off so she couldn't go see where the debris landed. Tatiana wasn't injured, but thousands more were, ranging from minor cuts to things more severe. One 52-year-old woman suffered from two fractured vertebrae and had to be sent to Moscow for further treatment. Hundreds of people suffered from eye pain in their eyes and temporary blindness. Some people were suffering from ultraviolet burns, similar to sunburns, to the point where their skin was peeling. In those cases, it was believed to be because they were near the snow and the snow was reflecting the UV rays. There were cuts and bruises from windows shattering, Office buildings were evacuated, classes were canceled, and some children were injured from the windows in their classrooms being blown in. For the entire day following the explosion, people reported smelling gunpowder or sulfur in the air, or just the smell of something burning. The roof of a factory collapsed, and it would later be revealed that over 7,000 buildings were damaged, totaling $33 million worth of repairs, some that the state covered, some that they didn't. This included hundreds of medical facilities, schools, universities, sports facilities, and apartment buildings. And because this was the thick of winter in Russia and a good chunk of people are missing windows, those affected had to quickly try and work out covering openings in buildings with anything possible. It was 5 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 15 Celsius outside. 100,000 homeowners were affected and the city's heating and water pipes had to be repaired. And even though the meteorites scattered across and outside the city, a chunk of it fell into Lake Chabarkal. It was frozen, of course, but there was a 20-foot wide hole in the ice. By June, scientists reported scanning the lake and finding a 2-foot wide meteorite buried in the muddy bottom of the lake. They estimated it weighed over 650 pounds. And it would take a little bit to get from the bottom of the lake, but... When they did get it in October, they realized it was over 1,400 pounds or 630 kilograms. It actually broke the scales they tried to use to weigh it. In November of 2013, footage was released showing the impact to the lake, but there were many videos prior to it that showed the meteor going across the city prior to exploding. And there was actually a lot of footage because of dash cams. Apparently, a very large number of drivers in Russia have dash cams, if not everyone, due to how large the country is and its lax, allegedly often corrupt law enforcement, and that the legal system doesn't really go with first-hand statements of car accidents, it's pretty much viewed as a requirement. Alexei Dozorov, a motorist rights activist, once said, quote, you can get into your car without your pants on, but never get into a car without a dash cam, end quote. Basically, it's not mandatory, but the circumstances almost make it that way. Especially after regulations were passed in 2009 by Russia's Ministry of Internal Affairs. It directly encouraged people to use dash cams because the regulations updated administrative procedures for accidents and their documentation and traffic enforcement. Prior to it passing, there were widespread allegations of corrupt traffic police. Drivers used dash cams to protect themselves against false accusations or bribery demands. Now, the updated regulations didn't stop concerns over police integrity, but they did enforce the need for clear evidence to handle issues after car accidents. It opened the door for courts to consider video evidence too, so people installed dash cams to protect their rights. And when wild or high-profile incidents were caught on dash cam, they would go viral on the internet, which caused more and more people to get them. Like, if you were to search on YouTube, Russia dash cam, you will see some things. But because of this, by 2013, there were so many people with dash cams in the car that it was easy to see the trajectory of the Chelyabinsk meteor. Scientists could piece together everything else using video footage and the angle and location of impact. Now, there were three explosions. Not just one, but the first one is what did the most damage. I found a video on YouTube that isn't a dash cam, but some guys who started recording after noticing the streak and I'm gonna play it. You'll hear a loud boom followed by a couple more and car alarms in the background. They are speaking in their native language, so I hope it's clean. I don't know what they're saying, but I don't think it is. If it's not clean, yes it is, but leave a comment so I can label the episode accordingly. Turn your volume down if you need to. 
Here it goes. Я сейчас подойду, подожди. Я сел. After the explosions, the guy pans the camera over and you can see the windows to the building he was in are warped with some missing and some with holes in the center. That video will be linked as the first source link on the website if you want to watch. Playing it out loud at home hurt my ears, so I'm surprised people didn't report hearing damage as injuries too. This event was the biggest impact from a space object on Earth since the Tunguska event in 1908 and it gave scientists data to study on how meteors behave when entering the atmosphere. The Chelyabinsk meteor completely took the world by surprise. It wasn't just that they were watching the Duende, the meteor that they were ready for. This meteor was actually just undetectable, even if they were looking for it. It never got bright enough to be detected from the ground on approach. It was small and came at Earth from the direction of the sun at about 43,000 miles per hour. Scientists were able to find out that based on the visible scars on the meteorite, it had hit something else before hitting Earth. Maybe even broke off a larger asteroid after two asteroids collided, and this is what sent it on its new course to eventually colliding with Earth. Knowing that this was a possibility, it happened once. It can happen again. So there were calls for systems to be put in place. What would have happened if the meteor we got hit with was the asteroid instead? Although, because it impacted at a shallow 18 degree angle, I did see that the risk might not have been super significant. Regardless, government officials in Russia and elsewhere suggested improving early detection systems. They wanted to expand the network of telescopes so that they could detect smaller near-Earth objects, like the Chelyabinsk meteor. Automated sky surveys and infrared telescopes stationed in space were suggested. They would track objects that are hard to detect from the ground, especially anything coming from the direction of the sun. An international partnership was suggested to strategize and share data, along with responding to and tracking near-Earth objects. Existing collaborations between space agencies were supposed to be strengthened between organizations like NASA, America's Space Agency, Roscosmos, Russia's Space Agency, and ESA, which is the European Space Agency. More collaboration should lead to being able to mitigate asteroid threats. People suggested different strategies for stopping asteroids, like sending a spacecraft to collide with an asteroid so that it would change course, detonating a nuclear device near an asteroid, to shift its path, and sending a spacecraft near an asteroid to use its gravitational force to nudge it in a different direction. There were calls to develop emergency plans that local governments could use to respond to airburst and other asteroid-related events, and educational programs for the public. Increased funding for research was brought up, like investing in asteroid discovery programs and space missions and increase monitoring on the ground by using optical telescopes and radar systems to cover blind spots in established near-Earth object detection systems. Following the meteor in 2013, steps have been taken to increase monitoring of near-Earth objects. In 2016, NASA established the Planetary Defense Coordination Office to manage collaborations between ground-based observatories and space-based initiatives. The projects focused on detecting, cataloging, and tracking potential hazardous objects and determining their impact risk. And actually, in 2022, NASA performed a double asteroid redirection test and successfully altered the orbit of an asteroid by hitting it. In 2028, NASA plans to launch a near-Earth object surveyor, a space-based telescope designed to find smaller near-Earth objects in the 460 feet or 140 meter range. Objects of that size are large enough to cause regional damage. And since this didn't happen in America, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the United Nations and international space agencies have supported things like the International Asteroid Warning Network and Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. So asteroid threats can be coordinated on a global scale. While progress has been noticeable, especially compared to where it was in 2013, 
Space agencies are still trying to find better ways to protect Earth from objects that could be on their way. Every day, Earth is hit with more than 100 tons or 90 metric tons of small objects and dust because its gravity attracts it from space. Luckily, the atmosphere burns most of the material up without really affecting anything, but you probably sometimes spot a streak of light at night or find small meteorites thinking that they're just normal rocks. But if you're worried you might not have a reason to, well, as far as a navigation engineer at NASA is concerned, they said the motion of asteroids and comets are predictable. And as long as they are spotted early, you can determine their path years in advance. Most objects aren't likely to come near Earth, but any that do can be tracked and mapped accordingly. Also, according to the engineer, no near-Earth object is large enough to potentially destroy Earth, like there aren't any asteroids or comets big enough to do that anywhere near us. But as far as a global catastrophe, asteroids at least 0.62 miles or one kilometer in size have the potential to cause a global disaster if they hit Earth. In 1998, U.S. Congress asked NASA to track more than 90% of potential near-Earth objects larger than global catastrophe size. Over 10 years ago, they finished doing that and have since concluded that none of the large objects discovered pose any impact threat over the next century. But the way it's worded does make me wonder. By the way, did you catch the asteroid that lit up the Russian sky just a day or two ago? Stay safe, and I'll be back next Thursday. Sources can be found at occurrencepod.com, which is linked in the show notes, along with any other relevant information.